Hesiod's Theogony is a basic textbook of Greek religion. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Today we have five essential facts about the first Greek poet, and that's Hesiod. Our first essential fact is that unlike his contemporary Homer, who's probably not an individual at all, Hesiod is an actual guy. He's a person. He has a hometown, a history, and also a deadbeat brother he has to deal with. He actually names himself in his poetry, which is something that many, if not most, of his contemporaries and subsequent poets don't do. According to the tidbits he gives us in his own poetry, Hesiod's father came from Chime in Aeolia, which is on the coast of Asia Minor, a little south of the island Lesbos. The old man crossed the sea to settle at a hamlet near Thespia in Boeotia named Ascra. Ascra is below Mount Helicon, the range of mountains between the central mainland plains of Boeotia and the Gulf of Corinth. We also get details of Hesiod's participation in a local poetic performance. This event took place at the funeral games for a local big shot named Amphidamus across the Euboean Gulf at Chalkis. This event was sort of a county fair, where our hero wins first prize with his hymnos and dedicates what he wins, his tripod, to the muses at Mount Helicon. Of course, we don't know how much of all of this is historically true, but it is presented as being true, and that's something at least, that's something to hold on to. Now, it's definitely true that bronze tripods, which were vertical-legged cauldrons, were prestige prizes and dedications of the times when he had lived. We know this especially from the excavations at Olympia. It's also true that Chalkis was a legitimately vibrant community in Hesiod's time, which is around 750 BCE. All in all, we get a picture of a poet who travels about and whose venues included big public occasions where each poet could compete to win attention, prestige, and rewards. Now, why funeral games? Funeral games were dedicated to significant figures and were meant to be a glorious memorial to the deceased. They were an occasion for the surviving relatives to act conspicuously and generously, and it was some kind of consolation for his family. It's possible that the entire point of the exercise was that death should not, if the fun of the games has anything to do with it, obliterate all delight from human life. Life has to go on. Our second fact is that the ancient Greeks believed that Hesiod once competed in a sing-off, an ancient poetry contest, with his great rival Homer, if you will. This sing-off was a great clash of styles. It was the storyteller of glorious champions, Homer, versus the font of homely wisdom, Hesiod. This contest of Homer and Hesiod, as it is called, only comes down to us in one manuscript. It's a compilation of prose and hexameter verse written shortly after or during the reign of the emperor Hadrian. The original tale of the poetic competition appears to have been taken from the statements by Hesiod that he had once won the poetic prize at the aforementioned funeral game for Amphidamus at Chalkis. Apparently, it was Hesiod who challenged Homer first. It's always Hesiod who challenges Homer. First, the great Homer steps forward and answers questions in hexameter verse regarding the philosophy of life, and then he completes hexameter couplets, which were begun by his rival Hesiod. Finally, both poets provide model examples of their poetic art. Homer performs from the Iliad and Hesiod from the works and days. Now, maybe contrary to our expectations, the judge decides for the peaceful poetry of Hesiod against the warlike epics of Homer. He wins with these lines from his works and days. But when the Pleiades and Hyades and strong Orion begin to set, then remember to plough in season. And so, the completed year will fitly pass beneath the earth. But when the Pleiades plunge into the misty sea because of Orion's rude strength, if desire for uncomfortable seafaring seize you, then truly gales of all kinds will rage. Then keep ships no longer on the sparkling sea, but be sure to till the land as is right. Honestly, it's pretty nice. Now, fact three is that Hesiod and Homer, while rivals in their singing contest, are very often cited as a pair. They were considered the twin founders of Greek poetry, myth and religion, and even the twin founders of the Greek mentality writ large. In ancient times, what it meant to be a Greek started with Hesiod from Ascra and Homer from, well, where, who knows where, we don't know where he's from. The early philosophers, scientists, and sages who came along after Hesiod and Homer and set themselves up as the sources of new wisdom denounced these two fuddy-duddies as purveyors of old-fashioned and ridiculous ideas. Xenophanes, for example, a philosopher who lived in the second half of the 5th century, says Homer and Hesiod attributed to the gods all of the things which among men are shameful and blameworthy. Hesiod's Theogony is a basic textbook of Greek religion. The story is told in a series of dynastic episodes which involve the overthrow of a tyrannical father by his youngest son. The powers of the universe and the ruling gods are introduced and organized through genealogy, lineages, and giving birth. The gods are arranged in four generations. The first generation are the elemental figures like Chaos, Eros, and Tartarus. 
second generation comes to power through the hideous deed, the castration of the sky god Uranus by Kronos, while the third generation, the Olympians, under the leadership of Zeus, is victorious in the great battle against the Titans and establishes their lasting dominion. Now there's one final hurdle for Zeus to overcome, and that is to put down the doomed revolt of the monstrous Typhaeus, or Typhon, the son of Gaia and Tartarus. Finally, the fourth generation, our generation, mainly consists of Zeus's offspring, the demigods, and the half-mortals who make up Hesiod's world as he knew it. Now for both central myths, the succession myth and the battle myth, there are detailed Near Eastern parallels from the Hittite and Assyrian literature. And because of this fact, the myths have sometimes been regarded as borrowings from the ancient traditions of Asia Minor. And that brings us to our fourth fact, that Hesiod took all of his ideas from the Near East. <laughs> At around 1200 BCE, from Greece through Anatolia to Syria and Palestine, a mysterious cataclysm rocked the Mediterranean. This event or series of events is most often attributed on the basis of Egyptian texts to an invasion of the mysterious sea peoples. And it was the end of the Mycenaeans and their Linear B writing system, an ancient form of Greek. The next time that writing appeared in Greece was the emergence of the poems of Hesiod and Homer, which was written in an alphabet borrowed from Phoenicia at around 750 BCE. Now, after the upheaval and devastation which marked the transition from the Bronze Age to the Early Iron Age, it took a while, but eventually trade and communication picked back up, especially between the Phoenicians of Sidon and Tyre and the Greeks of the mainland. At around 850 BCE, Phoenicians from Tyre were already settling at Kidion on Cyprus, and in 814, the famous city of Carthage was founded in North Africa. For their part, it was during this period that Greek traders first reached Syria and the Levantine coast. Greek merchants are present on Almina on the Orontes River from around the end of the 9th century. At around this time, heirloom objects from the Near East begin to appear at Greek sites in increasing numbers, especially in the rapidly evolving Greek sanctuaries of Olympia and Delphi. Simultaneously, Greek artistic style is taking up, imitating, and transforming the motifs of Eastern art. Skilled craftsmen traveling to wherever the work was plentiful and spreading their knowledge across the Mediterranean must have been a crucial part of this process. Now to their number, we can plausibly possibly add poets, priests, and wise men who would have brought the wisdom of ancient Akkadian and Babylonian cultures to the eager ears of young Hesiod in dusty Ascra. For example, in the Enema Elish, the Babylonian poem of creation, we begin with a pair of elemental primeval parents, Apsu and Tiamat. This is mirrored by Hesiod's Uranos and Gaia. The parents beget children who in each case are confined within their mother and cause her distress. The father hates them, but the mother does not. In both poems, the children fall silent with fear. Then one god takes courage, Ea, the wise god in the Enema Elish, Kronos, the cunning god in the Theogony. Each overcomes the oppressive father by means of a trick, a magic sleep in one case, a bedtime ambush in the other. Kronos robs him of his symbols of strength, and the oppression is over. Now, of course, there are divergences. No wonder. In the Enema Elish, Ea does not become king, Ansar does, but he does in fact become the father of the eventual king, Marduk. And before Marduk ascends to the throne, he must face and overcome a huge and fearsome opponent. Marduk's opponent is Tiamat, while Zeus's opponent is not Gaia, but Gaia's son, Kronos. The two stories end with the establishment by the new king of the world order that we know, that Hesiod knew. Now our final essential fact is that Hesiod has a deadbeat brother, Perses, who he doesn't really like. Our hero's inheritance from his father in Ascara was actually a small piece of ground at the foot of Mount Helicon. And apparently this division, uh, this kleros, parcel, between Hesiod and his brother Perses was a bit contentious. Perses seems at first to have cheated Hesiod of his rightful share thanks to bringing the matter to the corrupt authorities or kings. And this kind of triggered Hesiod. Perses later fell on hard times and had to beg forgiveness from his thrifty, more successful brother. A large part of Hesiod's great poem, The Works and Days, is given over to haranguing his brother on these topics. Perses is reminded that Eris, or Strife, the goddess has two forms, a positive one that stimulates healthy competition, and a negative one that leads to envy and strife, and keeps people away from their work, something that Perseus possibly has trouble with, apparently. Further evils arise through the misuse of power, which puts humans on the level of the animals, whereas they should be following the law and the justice of Zeus. Unfortunately, it is likely that all of this advice fell on deaf ears and Perseus just went about his business. Thanks everybody very much for watching. If you liked this video, please do hit the like button and subscribe. It would really help me out a lot. And I'll see you next time. See you later.